Nej, men han måste kunna se eh, min skärm när jag ska mm. logga in mm. Just want to check that I have some sound here for, for later. Give me a second. No. Hello, please. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe we'll have sound. Maybe we won't. See what happens. Okay. All right, yeah, we're on. Hello, everyone. Very nice to be here. Um, we are going to talk to you about why girls just want to have fun uh, being in the video games industry and playing games, both of them. Uh, some introductions to ourselves. My name is Sarah, um, and I have been working with the user behavior and analyzing how to translate user needs into game design at Stardle. And um, I'm uh, unfortunately not as easy to sum up. I've been in the industry since 1996, started as a programmer, been uh, working on a lot of different games. I was the studio head of the DICE Stockholm studio when we did Battlefield back in 2001 until 2004. I have worked as an agent. I've been at Gotland and GGC uh, several times. I think the last time we concluded uh, last night here that there was a great game about, uh, Nintendo DS game about how to mix drinks that we looked at. And that we realized that we are really old because that was quite some time ago. Uh, now I work at Stardoll with uh, mobile uh, strategies and development mainly. And uh, I will tell you about Stardoll. Starl is the world's. I'll start with this. Starl experience is really about uh, creativity, uh, self-expression, and being social. We do uh, these games targeted towards teenage girls. So these are pictures from one of our mobile games, and it's launched 2006. And it really uh, have become this massive thing. So. Uh, these were numbers from, from uh, uh, last week, and last week we have over 242 million registered users, 28 languages all over the world, so it's by far the largest community for teenage girls. Now, um, uh, what we have uh, in, in registered numbers are less important. We have 15 to 16 million uniques every month, so it's still, still really big. Um, uh, what we do mainly is startle.com, it's a web community, uh, and it's all about empowering girls, having them playing, uh, expressing themselves, being creative, doing the stuff they like. Um, I think um, uh, really what Startle is about, and I'll, I'll tell you the story, uh, is uh, trying to enable girls to do what they like. Uh, the background story to Starl is quite amazing. It started in, in north of Finland in the 1940s, uh, where a lady called Lisa Brang was born. She had uh, several younger siblings, and um, well, her mother and father was out in the forest. Uh, she had to take care of them. They had no toys, 
So she did basically paper dolls from old newspapers for him. When she grew up, she wanted to be a designer, but her father just told her, not possible, you gotta work, help, you know, supply for the family. So skipping forward, she ended up uh, uh, somewhere in the 2000 era, uh, feeling kind of worked out, burned out, being home on sick leave, and thought, what should I do with my life? She bought a computer, started painting, using Flash, building up an amazing website called Paper Doll Heaven, with some help from her sons. And uh, that really took off. Uh, she was writing, um, she was doing sketches of kind of well-known characters, and you could dress them up, basically. VC company comes along, says this is going to be the next big thing. Lisa said, you do it, I'll sell it to you, I'll keep on working on my stuff, but you have some people run it for you. So the, the headquarters ended up in Soko, uh, where it was founded in 2004, and then Solo.com was launched in 2006. And it's owned by Index Capital and Sequoia Venture, uh, sorry, Index Ventures and Sequoia Capital, for you who know the VCs of the world. So, big company, uh, we have a couple of offices all over the place, it's pretty cool, I would say. What we're trying to do now is moving over to mobile. So, why the, are we here talking about girls in games, and women in games? Well, one of the reasons are, of course, that I've been in the industry for quite some time, and I've never been in an office where a majority of the employees are, are, are female, which is a, a new experience to me. Um, more importantly so, girls are 50% of the, the gamers. They want to play games, they want to play more games. Um, it's, there's a lot of arguments like, yeah, but you know, they only play the casual games or whatever, or whatever. But there's, there's been uh, research on the fact that you, know, you tend to play the casual games on your phone even longer hours per week than you play your first person shooter games. So. And why do we care? Well, there is an issue. People say that startle. Well, you can't talk about women and games, or games for women or girls, because you only do pink fashion games. Well, you could say that. We could stop doing games for girls specifically. Um, why not have them all start playing, I don't know, FIFA perhaps, or Hitman, or should we think about it in such a way that maybe it's good that the girls who like fashion, they have games to play, and maybe we should try to get some more boys playing that kind of games, rather than having the girls, you know, skipping what they like, and having to adjust to the male norm, which is usually uh, what's um, ruling the gaming industry. Now, it's so strange doing games. I love doing games for teenage girls. Uh, I've been doing first-person shooter games. I worked on big licenses like Silent Hill, Need for Speed, and what have you. But doing games for, for teenage girl, girls, I tell you, it's very, very difficult. Uh, they are uh, strong opinion. They are easy to, to switch to something new. Um, it's very hard uh, to get an understanding of what they like specifically. As a game designer or a game producer, it's one of the most challenging you know, tasks I ever had. Um, so I can really say it's, it's a great challenge. It's a lot of fun doing games for, for teenage girls. And I really think there is plenty of space in the game industry for games for all kinds of, of people. And our whole talk is about just that. There isn't, there isn't a stop uh, when it comes to uh, uh, what kind of games you could produce. We're not, we're not saying that, you know, stop doing games that are specifically only for boys. Stop doing games that are specifically only for, for girls. What we're here to talk about is, you know, respect the users, respect the people who want to play games, give them the games to play, and just be nice to each other, basically. Because there's a lot of, of uh, stuff going on in the uh, community right now that are kind of questionable, and we'll get into that later. Um, we, uh, we want to talk about the fact that we think 
there is a problem with objectifying girls. We're not really including girls and, and women into to the game industry from a, a game design perspective sometimes, which is really stupid from a business perspective because as we've seen, 50% of the industry uh, or the buyers are basically women. So if you're in this industry for making money, you should probably make sure that you include one of the, the biggest, uh, one of the halves of the industry, of the consumers. So uh, expand your market by not excluding half of it is basically what we're talking about. So you might say, is there really a problem? Well, we'll show you later, there's, there's some good signs on things being better, but you know, just to exemplify what we're talking about, because it's so easy to get stuck in what you are grown up with. Uh, it's so easy to just see the things based on the norm or what you have uh, um, always experienced. Uh, and, you know, really difficult to put, out, uh, put on these other glasses, the gender glasses or what to call them, right? So, it really is about can you see the pattern sometimes that are forming? And what we want to do is show you there, there is some crazy stuff going on. To, to exemplify this, I, I want to use this, this lady with the nice salad who has, in, who has a great time. There, there's a bunch of, uh, this is really not from the game industry, but it gives a good illustration, I think. So, so you can buy stock photos. My dear wife, who is in the magazine business doing magazines, she buys a lot of these photos and I put them into to their magazines. And you've probably seen the example here. There is like a genre which is just full of women sitting there eating their salad laughing. It's kind of weird. There is not the same with guys. They usually just stand there and looking angry. Um, when you start seeing these patterns uh, evolving, when you see this, uh, you know, uh, in, in a larger scale of things, uh, you start to see that there's probably something here to fix. My next example is even worse, I think, because it has kind of a sexual undertone, which makes it really, you know, really weird. But why? I, what's, what's difficult with drinking water? <laughs> I refuse to believe that these ladies, these photo models, whatever they are, they have just no control of their, their limbs and they can't drink. Something's going on here. And I challenge, well, there is actually a good example out now of some, some guys who are just making fun of this and they have done a similar picture of themselves basically trying to, to exemplify this. But when you look at, at uh, pictures in general, there's, there's nothing similar for men. Another example. Uh, I'm going to show you there's some good examples showing up as well, but things don't always tend to get better. Now, Lego, I think this is a beautiful, beautiful ad. This nice little girl, super happy with what she built. This whole ad is about creativity, you know, build something, create something, everyone can do it. It's fantastic. Lego from 1981, I think it is, right? Lego today. This uh, piece of toys are, are uh, targeted mainly towards girls, and uh, one of the, the you know ways of them you know marketing it is that fewer pieces, easier to build. Because you know I have two daughters at home. I can tell you they're not they're not exactly stupid. Um, I think they could handle the same amount of pieces as boys. Now this is still on the on the line of fairly, you know, you, you could argue with the Legos of the world if, if, if this is okay or not, but there's also some really, really crazy bad examples out there. Scarlet Blade. Well, game from, from a company called Area, a South Korean company. Uh, you basically run around as a female character dressed in fairly little clothes. Um, now, the whole kind of sexual undertone is this is just kind of disturbing to begin with. However, what really made me go nuts uh, in a bad way, angry, that is, 
is the fact that there is a special item where you just unseal the clothes so they run around naked. Because that's what you want to do in a game full of monsters. Very, very, very strange. So, with that, I'm going to leave over to Sarah here because we're trying to do this in a gender you know, equal way. Yes. And Sarah is much smarter than me as well. So, um, it's because I'm an engineer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll step aside. <laughs> All right. So, um, this is a typical scenario when you're playing games. Um, MMOs, for example, uh, either if you're a girl, you know, you, you can choose either to be a guy and have the full on uh, equipment and gear that protects you against the, you know, the enemies, or you can choose to have very little protection that will basically get you killed if this were, you know, in a real scenario. And, you know, it, it's tiring, it's really tiring. Um, so this website, um, yeah, Bits of Tropes vs. Women is a Tumblr uh, showcasing some patterns in all of our favorite games from like way back when to today. And it's, it's when you put it in this context, um, when you see all the examples put together, you start seeing this pattern that Tobias was talking about earlier. And um, the, the typical ones are then the, the damsel in distress, the sexually objectified woman, or um, no women at all in games, actually. And then we have the community problems. Uh, this is from a website called fatsluttyorugly.com, uh, where, where girls send in their, you know, like screenshots from the messages that they're receiving in their inbox through everything from, I think it was like Wii or Xbox. Um, and they're getting these messages for no reason at all. And it's really uncomfortable seeing this like here today. And just imagine what it would feel like uh, receiving these kind of messages. And you know, when, when I speak about the, these things, then people ask me, well, what about the guys? I mean, the guys are receiving things like, oh, you're a faggot or you're, you know, whatever. And, um, and I asked, I've been asking guys, I was like, how do you feel about that? What are you doing? They're like, well, you know, that's just how it is. You just ignore it or just say something worse back. And I was like, seriously? Because why would you take that? When, why, why aren't you doing anything about it? But it's become such a thing for guys that, you know, guys are supposed to behave this way and you're supposed to man up and not take any shit um, instead of, you know, actually being emotionally challenged by this kind of behavior. So what happens when women bring these issues up? Um, just a really bad example, or I mean horrible example, is when Anita Sarkeesian was doing her Kickstarter for her Tropes vs. Women uh, documentary videos. And people just raged. They did not like that at all. And she's, you know, she's putting herself out there still today. She's just released her second episode. And she's really brave. And, you know, this is the response she's getting. And, you know, she's, she's still going. She's still keeping strong and sort of being a leader in this industry with putting, you know, the word forward. Um, so, yeah, so they basically went into her Wikipedia and just put all this offensive content in there for no, no reason at all. Because, yeah, that really helps them, you know. Like, I don't know, what, what are they getting from this? But almost worse was this example. Um, where this person just made a flash game that y you win by punching the shit out of Anita Sarkeesian. And so this person put all of his time and energy into creating this and spreading it around and people were playing it like it was harmless fun. And I'm just, I'm just questioning myself, what are people getting out of this type of action and behavior? I don't see anything good coming from this. And so, what happens when game studios start to, you know, market themselves as doing research about women and wanting to, you know, do games that cater more towards that target group. So not necessarily about making girl games, but making games that are directed towards a certain target group and, and they happen to be women. So this is people's reactions to some other studios that have been doing, you know, games that they would like girls to play. Um, who are, yeah, they're doing research, they're interviewing girls, they're talking to them and trying to find out, you know, like, how can we make a game that you will want to play? And, um, yeah, and this is the stuff that we have to deal with at Stardle as well. 
because people don't like that. People don't like that suddenly we have to cater towards women because apparently girl gamers or, you know, gamers who happen to be female are, have, have not existed ever, uh, which is strange because I'm, I'm born 1987 and I've been playing games since I can remember, you know, like I was so young when I started playing. I had, I had the Sega Master System at home. You know, I was playing games from a really young age. Um, but it doesn't matter because there are girls who are my age, 25, today, who are just starting to learn to appreciate games. And that's amazing too. I love that. I love when people start paying attention to one of my hobbies. So, this is in Swedish, um, but basically they're saying, well, isn't like, like gender and um, equality type of questions that, um, you know, should, should be both relevant to you and to me, even if we're guys. And then the other guy is like, well, I just learned how to, you know, take out the trash and, you know, sort the trash. So um, sh shouldn't I be able to live a little bit as well? Like, do I even have to care? Because, you know, I'm a guy. So why should I care about gender issues? Um, and then this meme, which is a contradiction. Um, yeah. Video games are an art form, should be taken seriously. It's, it's a high profitable business right now. And we need to give off that message that this is a professional place where we want professional people working. And yeah, you can't just, you know, ignore the sexist or anything offensive that's disrespecting people, your customers, uh, within this professional business. Let's see here. Yeah. Um, and the sound stopped working, but there's always a first time for everything, I think, so I think we're good to go. <clears throat> we'll try to illustrate this by making our own sounds, then. Yes! Yes! It's going to uh, be awesome. Vo voice acting. Yes. Bring my cinemas. Okay. Ah, pang pang. Oh, I shot you. <laughs> Suck my dick! Oh, is there a girl online? The guys ask there on the chat, and she says, uh, girl? Uh, what do you mean? And I better check. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they go nuts and they just say, Oh, it's a girl! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Ah, you're dead, bitch. Go play some girl games. And she thinks, perhaps, I should play some girl games. This is an awesome movie. It ends happily. We don't show you the whole one. Uh, her brother and her father comes to help her, and uh, it all ends very good. You can really recommend that uh, uh, place. You can, uh, if you just it's search that, yeah. hey, "Hey Ash" on Game Trails, you should see it. Yeah. It's a show where they have lots of funny themes, um, but this one in particular was was hilarious because they were um, basically telling her, because she's a girl, "Go play girl games. You're not allowed to play." our game, which is a boy game. Um, and then she starts playing the game, and then her dad just runs in, and he's like, move over. This is my game. I rock at this. And then, then you see her brother. He's like, wait, are you playing whatever it was, a Justin Timberlake makeup game? And dad's like, yeah, leave me alone. And then um, you, you see a screenshot of the, the dad's you know, final work in the game. Um, and he's really proud. <laughs> so just... Um, yeah, just showcasing that, you know, like, even if you're a guy, you, you can play these types of games too. I mean, that should be totally okay. Um, and yeah, and then, and then, yeah, this scenario. Um, I'm going to let you guys read.
get back to the kitchen. Um, little did they know that she had gotten the imported version of the Japanese Final Fantasy III that she was talking about and asking them if they wanted to join her in on the gaming experience. But she was deemed a fake geek girl because the guys actually didn't know that she had that game. Um, but what I want to illustrate with that example is that, you know, like, some, some people are just um, dismissing girls who either, you know, either they have been, you know, experienced gamers for a long time or they're just getting in, into the gaming world and um, deemed as, you know, fake geek girls because apparently you haven't been playing the game on Sega from 1997 and like all, all the titles in the series and therefore you're not a true gamer because you have to know this and this and this and that. Um, which, you know, that, that's really unfair because, to be honest, uh, neither have them, right? Like, n all people who, who apparently are true gamers um, or true geeks, they haven't followed, you know, the, the same rules either. You know, everyone is different and everyone is, you know, getting into this at their own pace. And if you like certain things within the like, geek culture, gaming culture, whatever, doesn't mean that you're not interested in that. So this whole fake geek girl, phenomenon that has been going on, that has been, you know, talked about by respected people in the industry. Um, it's ridiculous. I don't understand at all why it exists. Because there's no fake geek guys. Or, I don't know, have you guys heard of any fake geek guys anywhere? I haven't. Um, but basically, like, the last one. You can't really read it, but it says, um, enthusiastically explores new media and related subculture driven away by territorial assholes. That is basically what is going on, and that is probably the biggest trigger. Yeah, so once again, um, if we showcase the norm, which is a white male between the ages of 15 and 25, that is, that has set the standards for how a true geek or a true gamer is supposed to be, and if you don't fit into that mold, then you're fake. So you're not allowed to like anything um, that is not, you know, Han Solo if you claim to like Star Wars, or if you, you know, if you love to read, say, Harry Potter or Twilight, then you're, you're a fakey girl because that's not real fantasy, because real fantasy is a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. Um, so yeah, fake geek girl, fake geek girl, and the norm, which is also usually the true gamer. So we want to challenge this, right? Because we don't, we don't believe in this. And we wonder, is this really a battle worth fighting for? Um, are we the only ones doing this? Um, what about, you know, young women? Are, are, do they care about this? You know, of course they do. And they're fighting this. They are, you know, young women are making documentaries regarding games, regarding geek culture, regarding anything that they have a passion for. And interviewing other women, interviewing guys who, you know, like have this type of attitude and asking, why, why has this risen within, you know, a culture that has been so, you know, like, um, put down? Yeah, it's kind of strange. It's, it's, uh, the gaming culture is very young, but we're already very, um, very conservative, I would say. It's very weird. Yes. So, um, a lot of guys I've talked to that, you know, like, on the internet, of course, so anonymously, um, that have been, you know, like, saying like, oh, these girls are so fake and stuff like that. This is, you know, this is our culture. Why are they even, they're just wanting to get attention, you know? Um, so, and, and they, they say that, well, we've, we've been the losers our whole lives. And, you know, girls have been pointing at us and telling us to fuck off. And it just, it's just like the, the punk culture, you know? Like, the punks were the rebels. They were the alternatives. They were the, you know, the people that weren't really, uh, they didn't really fit in, right? And so now that they're mainstream and they're cool, um, they won't let other people in. So, you know, it, it's just a catch-22 here. It doesn't make sense. Um, so, yeah, so the Twitter campaign, one reason why. Um, they, they also held a talk about it at the GDC, um, where women tweet some, some of the things you have to deal with being a female game developer in the industry. And um, these are just four examples. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is... It, it's good that we talk about this because um, yeah, sure, we want, to, we want more girls in the gaming industry, but they have a right to know also what, what the attitudes are, what's going on, and some of the things they, they, 
may have to deal with. You know, we have to be honest and open about these things. But then there's also one reason to be, which is, you know, the awesome things about being in the gaming industry. We need to lift these forward just as much as the problems, because this makes it a battle worth fighting for. I think my favorite here, um, the feeling when you whip out a computer, iPhone, whatever, and said, I made this, and someone engages with it. Imagine you students here today, um, and everyone else here today, playing your games, talking to you about your games, loving your games, because they're awesome. You know, that feeling that you get, that, that is truly authentic, and that will drive you forward, that will motivate you to becoming even better and continuing on in this field. Another, another good example of what we're really trying to do is, there's, we're not trying to paint a too black picture. There's really good progress, and I think, uh, what really made me happy was here in, in the beginning of April when Sony went out and said, well, we're gonna, we really want female develop, developers on PlayStation 4, right? Even these big corporations, they see it. I mean, they, they see it from a, a business uh, perspective as well, but also uh, stepping forward and saying, hey, this is important. Now, I think uh, they, they pointed a very good thing here. Uh, what usually happened in the, in the past is uh, you look at a game and say, okay, we're going to do it for, for teenage girls, we'll just pink it and shrink it, right? You make it more simple, make it pink, like they did with the Lego there in the beginning. And we, at Starla, we've, we've got the perception of pink a lot. Um, I even had a person coming up to me and saying, well, you know, Starla is so extremely pink, you know, you're sending out the signals about doing you know, games for girls so much, uh, it's like, stop doing that. Even your logo is pink, he said. I was like, no, it's not. He's like, yeah, it's super pink. Like, stop being so pink. I was like, no, our logo is not pink. And he was just like, it is pink. I had to pull up my business card and show him. It's like, it's black and, and yellow and uh, white. And he was like, okay. So sometimes you really get kind of stuck in this. Um, we, we reason about pink at our, our team. We. Um, the last game we did on, on uh, iOS was uh, we actively tried to stay away from pink because it's such a, a loaded color. Um, in the end, we, it really was the best color for a certain little uh, text piece. So we had it in there and we realized pink is a very nice color. Uh, so is blue, but you don't like use it all the time. You don't overuse it, right? In balance with other things, you know, it's it's. Use it with sense, uh, but it's, it's usually so that that pink goes to be um, the sig significant thing for team, uh, for for games for girls. And I think uh, what it says here in the Sony article, we're not going down the route of making the console pink, of course, and, which is kind of natural. Now, I would actually love to have a pink PS4. <laughs> it would be pretty awesome to have it. Uh, so I think that's a bit. Uh, maybe we should uh, we should buy some PS4s when they come out and custom paint them, sell them at a higher price, it would be nice. Anywho, other good examples, uh, and there's plenty of them. Uh, just some few good friends in the industry, uh, Silicon Sisters up in Vancouver, the lady to the left there uh, is, uh, has been in uh, the games industry as a producer for a long, long time at Radical uh, in Vancouver, uh, and now they're doing games for girls. They put in a lot of efforts into research about what girls, you know, like compared to boys. And it's quite interesting. It's definitely not so that boys and girls like exactly the same games. There are differences. And they spent, I think it was eight or nine months on just doing research on that, you know, summing up uh, all the different available resources on, on you, know, you know, brain, basically how the brain behaves at uh, different ages and genders and so forth. And there is some small differences, like, um, uh, girls have an easier time to, to like uh, games with uh, patterns, where boys go for a little bit more kind of solid color blocks, uh, stuff like that. So, uh, but it, and, and social interaction uh, is a bit more important for girls. But it's not, it's not any like huge gaps between them either. So it's probably more things in common than apart. So it consists of anywho, they do, do, they do great games. Another good example is, is Mighty Play in San Francisco. These two ladies have, have 
long, long experience. I'm, I think it says here uh, 20 years. Madeleine has been in the industry for over 20 years. Uh, there's not even, there's very few in the Swedish game industry has spent that long time in the industry. So uh, uh, it's pretty amazing. There's good examples out there of studios run by women. And I think also the obvious example is uh, 343 who did uh, Halo 4 run by, by two uh, women. Um, Kiki Wolfkill, who's the executive producer there, uh, was very strongly uh, against this kind of uh, examples we've seen on outrage on the communities and said, well, when you're going to play our Halo game, if you behave like that on, on Xbox Live, we're going we're gonna to ban you from the system. Really good having people like that stepping up and just putting, putting a stop to it. Yeah, so, um, so let's get back to all the fun stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys read about this article, but it's a seven-year-old who just, uh, you know, programmed her first game and designed it herself. Um, and she put in all the elements that she loves, which was like, you know, vampires and ballerinas and jewels. And she was like, of course that can become a game. And uh, she was so proud of it. And there are many kids today, you know, getting into those kind of thoughts. There are great programming tools that are, you know, like, it's not like, programming, programming like we are taught in school, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's game development, design. Um, even, you know, young kids uh, playing around with the Raspberry Pi, we're seeing a lot of that, and that is really cool um, and really inspiring. So what I have done now, like this year, is started uh, a small community of like 700 people, mainly females, who are either gaming or interested in the subject of gaming. And, you know, like, I'm having a lot of young teenage girls, like, in the U.S. and in Canada asking me how to become a game developer. And that is amazing. Like, that is so awesome. Because when I was a teenage girl, that thought didn't exist for me. That thought didn't even ex exist for me when I started uh, my studies at the university in Stockholm um, called um, the Royal IT. Um, I'm an engineer, and this is my background. Um, it, it Actually, my first, it was... Yeah, I had, I had a game design course like in my third year that got me into the thought of, oh, wow, you can actually uh, make games and pursue a career within games. That is really cool. So, um, yeah, a lot of people are getting up the interest for this, and that is really cool. And then some great examples um, within the industry, uh, within games. Uh, so we have Zoe from Dreamfall, really strong female protagonist, uh, which has a lot of layers to her. She, it's character development within the game. Um, you have Alice and Alice Madness Returns. Uh, she's totally badass. Uh, Faith Connors from Mirror's Edge, my favorite, one of my favorite games. Um, and then Chell from Portal 2, another one of my favorite games. Um, and yeah, what's her? Oh, this is from Beyond Good and Evil. Jade, her name's Jade. Yeah, so see, she, she goes around and instead of attacking people with, with swords or, or weapons, she photographs. That's her, you know, like her weapon of choice. Just like with Portal, it's a first person shooter, but you're not going around killing people. So it's, you know, like a, just a different take on the same concept, which is really cool. And of course, Femship from Mass Effect 3. And everyone's favorite, <gasps> Samus <laughs> from Metroid. Um, you know, Samus has existed for a long time. So, you know, strong female protagonists yeah. all the way. And what I, what I want to show with this is that uh, this is one of the ways that you can, you know, uh, embrace female, the female audience by, by allowing them to play, you know, strong female protagonists. Just, you know, because so many games don't have that. So many games don't even have playable female characters at all to choose from. And we're also seeing a, a movement within, you know, like, game series. Uh, like, Lara Croft started out as this badass, one-dimensional, uh, hot girl who um, was really flat, just her character was so flat, her personality was so flat, and they took the same girl and they added layers to her, and they gave her humanistic, you know, human characteristics and weaknesses and strength all in one, and seeing, just seeing how, um, you know, like an old sex symbol is turning to a human, um, it, you know, you're, you can tell that there's a change going on within the industry. So, what to do if you want a good business? Um, and how do you avoid accidentally excluding half of your audience? Can you run for it? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, this is easy to say and very hard to do. Uh, but 
it's a good thing to keep in mind, I think. If you're forming, if you go out of, from school or you're forming your new uh, uh, studio, please try to really, from the beginning, try to think about it as, you know, uh, equal opportunity. Uh, how do we ensure that we have uh, people from all kinds of, of cultures, as well as genders, and whatever, to make the best possible games? I mean, these days, we're not making games only for Sweden. We're making games for the rest of Europe, US, South America, uh, Middle East, Asia, and, and you really need to, to take that in account. And we try to do that at, at Startle, ending up with, with more than 50% more than of, of the studio there being uh, females. And also from different cultures. We have people basically talking all these 28 languages that we support, and it's really good to, to have that cultural understanding. Um, when I was down the first time here at Gotland visiting uh, the education here, the games education, the first class I like to remember was pretty much, you know, we, we, we reacted uh, from DICE, who I represented at the time, that there was a lot of women in the, in the class. I like to remember it was pretty, maybe not 50-50, but a lot of them. Um, and at the time, DICE, when, when uh, we were building that up, really wanted to have uh, an equal uh, management team, and we worked very hard of having uh, in our management team, you know, balancing up the three guys. Uh, I was one of them who were studio heads with, with women on the other side, so our HR, our, our um, information position were filled by women, maybe in a kind of obvious, but also our CFO, which was really difficult to find at the time. Um, and um, we really took a long, long time on, on finding the right people, just making sure there is a balance here. We were making Rally games, we're making battlefield games, but we, we knew that we can't just go straight down into to, to, um, some sort of cave here. So, easy to say, hard to do. It's, uh, it's about making an effort, though. It's about like having that mindset, like, hey, we're going to try a little bit extra harder to try to reach out to women, women devs. It's not about, you know, okay, you're a girl, so you're in. It, it's, no, it's, you have to work hard. It, it's not easy. And it shouldn't be, like nothing should be easy. But. And of course, in the end, it's always about is it the right person for the job? Uh, it's not about how they dress or look or gender or culture, but uh, you know, uh, you gotta keep it in mind. Be aware of the problems. You know, always keep your gender glasses on. Uh, I got the big ones, I hope. Um, see these patterns uh, so you don't run into any of these traps and get, get stuck there. Because uh, it's so easy to just do it as the norm says, as you always done it before, as the other games, uh, uh, you know, um, have always done it. Don't try to challenge. Have a mindset of, of challenge, uh, uh, set minds. Research and test. Don't assume. Uh, I really learned this at Startle. I assumed I knew what teenage girls wanted to play. And uh, then we did some player testing, and uh, I could just take all my experience and throw it away and say, okay, there we go. Just start from the beginning. Really don't assume you know what, uh, for that matter, boys likes or girls likes or whatever it is. If you, if you really do uh, user testing uh, and, and not having that kind of assumption mindset, you will learn a lot. Uh, do it. So you can't really group like all boys or all girls into just one category. You have to dive deeper into your into your audience, pretty much. Um, so yeah, support and empower women, and this is really important. And this is done already, like within your team, within the company you work out. You know, like don't 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 be demeaning at all, and don't condensate women. Like just. Be respectful um, to, to everyone in your surroundings. And communicate with your customers, with your users. Communicate you know, to them with respect. And I know I've, I've found this in my research that sometimes it's not about game design elements that attract women. It's the way you communicate the game to women. It's the way you, it's in which spaces are you communicating your, way, or your game to the female audience. And you have to sort of know. You have to, um, you have to make the effort to know, like how to communicate in in a respectful way, and you know where. And know and listen to your customers. 
and I will say this over and over again, it's so important. And you have to find that balance between what your customers want and what you want to bring to your customers, because the customers aren't always right, but, you know, listen to them. So, our summary for today, and I hope that we can bring some thought-provoking um, stuff to you guys here. Um, respect people, respect that they have different tastes in games. Just, you know, like have a more open uh, perspective about what makes a good game and why do people play this game. Try to find out, like, why, are, if, if you're playing a mobile game, you may not call that a real game, you know? And, but, but, you know, if people are playing mobile games or casual games more than the average gamer is playing, you know, Call of Duty, for example. Um, ask them why, like, why do you love this game so much? Because you will learn a lot, trust me. And yep, and don't accept objectification. Uh, do react, basically. Uh, if you see something that's wrong, it's so easy these days. Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever social media, you can put your point out there. If a lot, a lot of people do that constantly, I think we'll, we'll much quicker see a, a faster change. And I, one of my examples there is uh, this game, I can't even remember the name of it, showed up on my Facebook mobile feed. And it was, you can play as a mage, or you can play as a magi magician, or a dwarf, or whatever it was. Uh, and, uh, but it was pretty male stereotypes you were able to play as a soldier and so forth. Uh, and, but the whole picture was just this lady with super big boobs. And, uh, I was like, what? She's like, it doesn't even, you know, the, the ad doesn't even make sense. And I, I felt then, if I'm out here talking about this, I need to react. So I just put it up there on my Twitter and Facebook and so forth and said, I think this is so wrong. You know, people, people start coming with all other examples. Yeah, and I saw this and I saw that. You know, we really lift this, this uh, awareness of this uh, up there. Uh, if everyone does this, or once a week, uh, it will go much quicker. And just as another example, uh, when it comes to male characters in games, they're usually really aggressive, really masculine, really, you know, not relatable for a lot of guys. Um, so, you know, like, many guys are indeed choosing female avatars because they have more character and personality to them, and they are more human, um, even with the boobs. So think about that too, think about the, male, uh, the males too, and the male characters. And yeah. Embrace people showing an interest in your passion and in your hobby because that is amazing and be happy for it and you know like embrace them embrace new gamers to the community embrace new game developers embrace anyone who's showing an interest because that's just the reason for you to talk about what you love and that is cool and you have a shared common interest with people um, and that brings people together more than you know dismissing them and keeping them outside of your elite community so. Yeah. And I'm, I think the, the you know to, to kind of sum up the the whole story, including Stardom here, Lisa Rang, who who came up with this idea and wanted to do games for girls. She wanted to be a designer. She was not allowed to by her parents because she she was needed to support the family, uh, doing cleaning houses and whatever. She then finally, you know, uh, now she's 67, 68 years old and retired uh, as of this month actually from Stardom. Uh, she uh, at least you know, ended by creating this amazing community with paper dolls for over 240 million people in the world. It's a pretty amazing story. You know, ever see that potential in every, every person, I would say. Great. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And questions. to the mic. If anyone want to ask some questions, we're happy to, to uh, there we go. Like this? Yeah, okay. Um, well, how I see it is that you're marketing women to women. Aren't you afraid of objectifying women as you portray them? Like, a woman made this game, you should buy this. Uh, are you afraid of people going like, oh, this is objectification or something like that? Yeah, when doing Startle uh, specifically, I know they put a lot of thoughts into this. Um, 
uh, really try to uh, make sure uh, that is not the case in, in Star Wars. Uh, it depends on how you look at it, I guess, uh, as well. You can play as a guy, uh, you can have uh, guy clothes and whatever, uh, so there's, there's an equal opportunity in that sense when you're playing Star Wars. Um, I do not think it is objectifying saying, well, if you like how you dress and how you do your hair or whatever it is, if that's one of your interests, uh, you shouldn't be allowed to do it. I think that's, that's, that's worse, actually. Um, and then you can go uh, you know, over the board uh, saying, well, you know, it's all about super slutty appearance and so forth, and we're really not doing that at Star Wars at all. I do remind you that we do have a big presence also in Middle East, uh, where you know, things like that would be a super big issue, uh, but for us it's not. Uh, the, our users are, are appreciating stall on there, so I, I think we're on the right side, the right side of the barrier there. Yeah, so well, at least for, for the startall.com product, um, people are there for, and we do like surveys and such uh, frequently asking why you're on Startle, why do you play it? And I mean, most of them are there because they have, a, they have an interest for design and creativity, and they feel that that's a way to get an outlet for that, as well as communicating with others who share the same. Uh, interest of fashion and design. It's also a really hardcore game. You look at how much time people play on, on Star.com. I was amazed and I started realizing uh, if the, the, you know, how you label a hardcore gamer is about how much time you spend in the game, we have a lot of hardcore gamers in Star.com. And it's really about, uh, you know, what you can do is not only create and design your stuff, you then sell it to others. You gain recognition. People, there's a whole kind of trading simulator in there that's just amazing uh, which you don't see with the first uh, the first site maybe but it's a really deep experience so um, I think also you know that's the risk when doing uh, games or a community for for uh, for a teenage girl group for example you get dismissed dismissed by the fact that well you know you only do fashion games well, it's a bit more than that but it's tricky Very cool I also have a uh, another question um, you speak of games and you refer to them as art and uh, there's a lot of talk of censoring content and saying that things aren't okay but it's art right wouldn't you want to allow people to express themselves how they want to uh, how their creative vision uh, what they had in mind I think that with art um Good art has a uh, somebody who's uh, you know sending it away, so to say, who's who created it, and and you can see that there is a point trying to be made um, uh, with that art, and even if it's you know um, it's very you know blunt or uh, aggressive or whatever you know really put things in your face, it's still trying to make a point. Uh, I think there's a difference between art and people who just want to do money on objectifying and taking like the easy way out and, and, and uh, um, just doing things uh, according to, to the norm and not dare to challenge it. I mean, artists usually really dare to challenge the norm, right? So I, think, I don't think there is a... Um, I think there is actually... And I, I think you specific, specifically showed it with your game out there that there is much more to game uh, than just game and having fun. You can really make a point with games, and I hope we can see more of that in the future. And it's also about finding that balance. Um, you know, a lot of people may want to have an emotional connection to the game, and that could be through story or that could be through their character. And if they can't relate to the character, they won't gain that emotional connection, which won't captivate them as much. And therefore, just, you know, trying to um, you know, like convey the message that you, no, you you can be yourself um, within the game. Like this is a, an outlet for you to be yourself and express yourself to have freedom, and then not you know force them to play as a character that they are supposed to identify themselves with that they cannot. So it's once again just you know how to communicate with your user and, and knowing their preferences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.
Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, um, creativity and startle, awesome. Um, I'm guessing that you also have a lot of boys playing it. Do you have any statistics on how many? Four uh, percent. Okay. So it's not that many. <laughs> no, it's pretty good. Okay. But out of you know how many registered? Yeah, out of 240. Yeah, no, but it's it's. Yeah, it's tricky. It's not that many boys playing it, uh, which I think is just what we've done. We've done a niche product. Uh, the good thing is that, that it's fairly safe and, and uh, you know, uh, environment where the girls can play and they don't have to, to listen to, to um, you know, the kind of examples that we saw on the screen before. So I think that's why if you're going into startle and trying to, to um, behave like that, uh, you kind of immediately get uh, thrown out. So. Are you allowed to have a non-gender? Sorry? Non-gender, like in the middle, in between boy and girl. Uh, no, we don't have that actually. Okay. It would be cool though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for a very interesting and talk and raising these important questions. Um, I, I was thinking about a lot of stuff, but and it's a tricky thing, this with stereotypes, because it, you always have to, and it is a, the game industry is so hard because you were talking about art, they, if you want to express it, it's also you have to, it have to you have to sell, you have to, it, it's so, cost is so um, expensive to create them, so you cannot be free in a, in a sense that you can be if you're an author. Anyhow, the question is, question of, I don't know, raising this, is when you show the example of, as I understood, as good examples of uh, girls in, in EU move, uh, games, they were like uh, moved into the, the male character. So you have either, you have this multi-layered woman, but still with boobs and curves, and you have the other one are women in the male suits or male stereotype. So I was thinking about how can you move it yet further to another level where you don't have this, where you have <laughs> another kind of, of avatars or characters in the, in the games. Because it's still, for me, it's like you have the, the feminist or the gender issues and you, you, dress, you have to dress like in a suit and then you will, you so still the, the male uh, uh, rules that, that uh, tells how, how it's supposed to work. So, so that sets the... the yeah, I, I definitely... If you understand what I I definitely agree. Um, I, I read this quote once that was, you know, this uh, product of this girl, she is feminine yet strong, as if those two contradict. Um, so I think that is the next step. Like, you know, showing just a regular woman um, that is not, that hasn't moved towards the norm, which is, you know, usually the male characters being strong and feminine and just, you know, normal. Um, that is definitely something that we've been talking about that is really important, so we definitely agree. But that is also a broader question within the game industry to just to bring, where are the new characters? Because this is, this is still the same as they've been, you know, the dragons and the relievers and the soldiers and the, the women and the... So we have. To, um, I'm interested in what's coming next. Yeah. I want to play this game about this soon-to-be 40-year-old trying to get rid of his all his excess fat character. Um, that would make me kind of, uh, you know, really feel with this uh, character. But usually the guys in the games I play, they're, they're pretty, yeah. pretty good, good yeah. looking. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I don't know how close I can stand. Um, yeah, so you talked about avoiding pink in your game because it's so loaded. Do you, don't you think, well, there's a point in doing that, but there's also the point in avoiding stuff that is so loaded in the gender area it just makes the gender question worse because you let it exist. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Uh, I, I think we actually did one. We had another game, a word puzzle game, which we made like super duper pink, <laughs> like over the top almost. Uh, uh, 
because we just got what the hell. Uh, I think it's very important. I mean, if you avoid the, the subject, uh, you will never be able to to process it, process it, and you know, get something out of it. So it's a very, very good point. And and as I said, that's basically the conclusion we came to. It's like, hey, we try to avoid pink, but then we realized it's a very nice color. We have to use it sometimes, not excessively, as we don't use any other color excessively. So um, I think it's a very and, and that applies to a lot of different uh, different uh, uh, parts of, of game design. I think you can, you can see it uh, uh, when designing a game um, uh, like that in, in many, many times. So it's a very good point. But then it's also about, um, you know, like using pink as an easy way to, you know, attract women to your products, like with uh, the PS or the, or the DS, I mean. Um, yeah, so we want to sell more DS to, uh, to girls, so we make it pink, because that's an easy solution for many companies. So what we're saying is just, you know, like, going beyond that, like, yeah, of course you can use pink, but, you know, maybe there's other factors as well that you need to think about when designing games that include that half of the market as well. I mean, we, it is kind of strange. I mean, it, it, there is not that kind of same urge to use blue for boys, I think. When we, we, when we did some user uh, research and asked people, and starting doing the games I, I've been working on at Storo, what makes you want to pick up a mobile game? Uh, and we asked girls from like 15 up to 25, and, and a couple of them said like, well, I'll play whatever, as long as it's not pink, because then it really feels like they want to target me so specifically, and it's very kind of diminishing of, of me as a person to, to have like a color define me, so it's like, refuse to play anything that's pink, but otherwise it's fine. I think that, that kind of, that's a good thought. I, I held two uh, like creative game design workshops this spring. Um, and one of the groups, we didn't even bring up the subject of colors. Because um, we, we, yeah, we just wanted natural colors in the game. But in the other game, it was the first thing when we talked about the colors and the theme, they were like, not all pink, like not just like crazy pink, but we want, you know, like smooth colors, like, like lavender or, um, you know, pastels, uh, blues and, you know, greens and stuff like that. So that was like the only time that actually someone told me that we don't want all pink in the game, but, you know, include other colors as well. So, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. We're yes. here during the day. Just to Thank you. Us. Thanks.